Yeah, I think of myself as a social scientist, even though I'm trained as a psychologist. And in our team, we have anthropologists and psychologists and sociologists working with us. At Intel, we make the best use of social science by understanding how people are behaving with technologies, how they're using them, how they're making their lives better or worse, or what they're doing. And then we think about how their lives are changing and how the technologies can change to suit their lives. So by understanding people and how they live and how our technologies integrate with them, we can make better technologies. You know, it's interesting. When, when you think about the technologies people are using today, we can get an idea about how they might think about using technologies in the future by understanding some of the ways their cultural values are changing. So for example, we know that ideas of what it means to own something is actually changing now, right? Whereas it used to be, I owned it, I keep it, it's mine, it's close, right? Now with things like Airbnb and Park Circa and other kinds of, of companies that make uh, various parts of your home available to others, it's temporarily owned by someone else. You can lease a driveway, you can lease your bedroom, right? And people have a different sense of what it means to own, but it also has a, people have a different sense of what it means to have a relationship with other folks, right? So people come into their homes, they get to know them, it extends their networks, it's a fun experience, right? And then they do it again. They don't have to do it all the time, but they do. And it's kind of fun. And so when we start seeing things like ownership changing, or what it means to be accountable, or what it means to participate socially, then we know that we have an indicator for the kinds of technologies we should start thinking about. When people own a book or a movie or a CD or something like that, right, it's something only they can have. E economists call that a rival good. It's something only you can have, somebody else can't have it when you have it. So you can loan it to somebody, but then you don't have it. When something's digital, it kind of becomes a non-rival good. It means that you can have a copy and someone else can have a copy, right? provided they pay for it and all. But you can have a copy and someone else can have a copy at the same time. That changes fundamentally how people think about goods and what it means to have a digital item. What it means to share it, what it means to send it around, what it means to circulate it. When things circulate, they become more valuable. Right? When people can actually circulate different kinds of things about themselves, whether it's where I am now, what I'm doing now, what plane I'm taking, any of that kind of thing. Those little bits of data actually gain value. Sometimes it's just social value, right? We have a stronger relationship. Sometimes it's economic value. So circulating goods means more value. And digital technologies allow more goods to circulate. That creates more value. Every time we have an interaction, whether it's with another company online or in real life, we're actually creating a little data stream, right? And right now, those data streams are owned or controlled by the people who are managing those data. What we'd, what we'd like to see is people be able to have access to the data streams that they actually create. There's, there's really no reason fundamentally that I as a person or you as a person shouldn't have access to all of your data and be the only person that has access to all of your data and then permit those data to be circulated in interesting ways, right? They protect your privacy, they protect your identity, they have to do all of that. We need technologies to allow that. But if you can have access to all of your data, then you can control its circulation. And you can theoretically get value from that the way companies get value from your data today. One of the questions we often get asked is, you know, what's going to be the killer device or what's going to be the one device to, to rule everything? And we don't think there's going to be one, or at least I think the probability of any one device really sort of conquering everything is, is really very low. What we see is a, a, a range of devices, a lot of idiosyncrasy being able to, to take form right, by the ability for people to combine different technologies in different ways with different form factors, with different sets of data, with different insides, right, to make all these different devices that people actually would like. And so you might like something in one form, and I might like something in some other form, and we can have what we want. And people will make those devices for us one way or another. And so we tend to think that there'll be more devices of a kind that will satisfy us and that they'll turn over with some rapidity and people will find them interesting, uh, even though what underlies them, the kinds of data they collect, the kinds of things they do for us, will remain more stable. But how those things happen, we think will change more quickly.